Welcome to the Science of Success. Introducing your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet, with more than 5 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we share the power of the experimental mindset. How can you use experiments to make better decisions and improve your life? What makes for a good experiment? We share all of this and much more with our guest, Stefan Tomke. In our previous episode, we shared how to memorize a deck of cards in less than 60 seconds, how to remember anything, and hacks from one of the world's leading memory experts, our previous guest, Nelson Dellis. Are you a fan of the show and have you been enjoying the content that we put together for you? If you have, I would love it if you signed up for our email list. We have some amazing content on there along with a really great free course that we put a ton of time into called How to Create Time for What Matters Most in Your Life. If that sounds exciting and interesting and you want a bunch of other free goodies and giveaways along with that, just go to successpodcast.com. You can sign up right on the homepage. That's successpodcast.com. Or if you're on your phone right now, all you have to do is text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Now, for our interview with Stefan. Stefan Tomke is a professor at Harvard Business School. He has worked with global firms on product, process, and technology development, organizational design and change, and strategy. He is a widely published author with articles in leading journals and is also author of the new book, Experimentation Works, The Surprising Power of Business Experiments. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including awards from Harvard in innovation and much more. Stefan, welcome to the Science of Success. Well, great to be here. Thanks, Matt. Well, we're so excited to have you on the show today, and there's so many insights. Experimentation has always been something that I've thought is so important, and I'm really excited to bring you on here and, and dig into it. But I want to start out with something that a lot of business leaders and business people today, when they're making decisions, what are the current tools that they're using to inform those decisions, and why might those not be necessarily the best approach? Well, you know, when you're thinking about decisions, you know, depending on what kind of decision you make, you know, there are various tools available. You know, if you're making financial decisions, for example, you know, you're calculating net present value and things like that. And, you know, so there's a whole arsenal of tools. But the big issue, and this is kind of what my book is really about, is innovation here, because innovation is fundamentally about uncertainty. So this is really this about decision making under uncertainty and you know we're usually in organizations we're all about driving out uncertainty you know in fact a lot of the traditional tools are about eliminating or minimizing uncertainty but in innovation you know uncertainty actually creates opportunity i always tell folks that you know in innovation uncertainty is your friend uncertainty and variability is your friend because it creates opportunity for someone else sort of to move into that space now why is then uncertainty so difficult? Why is sort of decision making under uncertainty so difficult? Well, it helps to be a little bit more precise here about what uncertainty really means. When it comes to innovation, you know, you face different kinds of uncertainties in a company every single day. First, there's R&D uncertainty. That is, you know, when you're trying to create something new, does it, and it could be a product or service or customer experience, does it actually work as intended? Then we have scale up uncertainty, you know, if we make something work, but can we scale it up? Can we make it at large volume, high quality, reasonable costs and so forth? Then we have customer experience uncertainty. If we're customer facing, do we really know that the customers want what we are creating? Are they willing to pay for it? And so lots of questions. And then finally, there is what I call business uncertainty. So if you're running a business, you need to make an investment decision and Again, the tools that we typically use for these kinds of things is net present value, internal rate of returns, and these kinds of things. But the reality, of course, is that when you're dealing with innovation and uncertainty, often you're the one who is actually creating the market. You're creating the segment. How do you put a net present value on something that doesn't exist yet? So how do we deal with this, Matt? Well, we rely on experience. But 
experience can really kind of get in the way for sort of a whole myriad of reasons. Then, you know, some of the listeners may say, well, you know, but now we live in a world of big data and analytics and we can do kind of, we can use all that, you know, to make decision making better. But here we run into a, another set of problems. That is, if something is really novel, by definition, there is less data. Because if there was a lot of data around, that means someone has already done it before. It wouldn't be very novel. Then, of course, context matters. Something that works in one context doesn't work in another context. And then third, I think, and this is a big problem, and happy to maybe go more deeply into that, when you're running analysis on a lot of data, you get correlations. Correlations means that you know one variable changes along with another variable. They co-vary. But you don't really get information about causation. And, of course, we're really interested in causation. We want to know that if I take an action, I want to have a certain outcome. And so you can see where kind of the challenges come in when you're sort of traditional decision making. And of course, that's where the experiment comes in, because the experiment allows us to address some of these dilemmas. And a well-designed control experiment will actually tell me something about causality. Yeah, that's a great insight into what uncertainty is and how we start to think about making decisions under conditions of uncertainty. That topic especially has been one that we've really strived hard to answer on the podcast. But I'm curious, coming back to innovation, before we even dig into experimentation, which is a huge component of this, but tell me about innovation and what is the actual definition of innovation and what is the difference between that and things like invention and what people often perceive innovation being? Well, when we think about innovation, we really think about two things. First sort of element of innovation is, of course, novelty. And that's what usually comes to mind right away. But then there's also value. So it's novelty plus value. That makes it very different than the word invention. The word invention is usually associated with patents. And for those of you who have your name on a patent, know that there is no value requirement in a patent. It just has to be new, non-obvious, and never published before. And so invention is an input to innovation, but it's not quite the same thing. In fact, I've seen companies that have lots of patents that created no value for anybody. Now, the outputs of innovation could be many things. It could be you know, products, could be services, it could be new customer experiences, and then, of course, it could be processes. I've seen companies that are really great at process innovation. Could be new technologies. And then, and this is perhaps one of the most difficult things to do for companies, it's business model innovation. How do you create a new business model while you're trying to make money with an existing business model? Now, when we think about innovation, we also think about different degrees. Often, Matt, you know, when people talk about innovation, they often think about disruption or breakthroughs and these kinds of things. Well, most innovation in the world is incremental. And I think it's actually perfectly okay because incremental innovation is more predictable. Incremental innovation is something that everybody can do. If, you know, if I told all your listeners from tomorrow morning on, you're going to be a disruptive innovator, most of us would know what to do. Like, do I come to work late? Do I dress differently? I mean, what do I actually do? And then, of course, incremental innovation in the digital age is a little different than we traditionally think about incremental innovation. You know, in the past, Matt, we associated you know, incremental innovation with incremental changes in performance. In the digital world, that's no longer true. In fact, incremental small changes can have a massive impact on performance because if you're digital, you can scale things instantly and you can scale it to possibly hundreds of millions of people. So even you know, perhaps a two or three or four percent change, you know, that's considered to be small can actually have you know, tens or even hundreds of millions of revenue impact. So what is innovation? Well, it's all of this. <laughs> it's all of this, what I just described. And, and to do it, you really need different models of approaching it. That's a great point. And you have a really good story about Bing and a, a very small change that they made there that led to a huge impact. Because, And I'd like to hear that because it's so important to understand 
that almost like the power of compound interest, these little changes can accrue and create huge results. Absolutely, Matt. And, you know, a big kind of a big change is usually the result of the sum of many small changes. The Microsoft example or the big example is a fascinating example. So there's a Microsoft employee who was working on the search engine, of course, had an idea about changing the way displayed sort of ad headlines. So he thought, you know, by, you know, taking some of the subtext, you know, in the headline and and moving it up and making sort of the headline longer, that could actually have an impact on user engagement. So the employee kind of showed this to a manager and the manager kind of looked at it and wasn't really sure whether this would lead to anything because you can imagine that, you know, when you're adding more to a headline, maybe, you know, users will not read the headline because it's too long. So in any case, the manager basically didn't pick up on that. And this idea kind of just lingered, you know, it wasn't a complex idea, you know, would only take a few days to actually make the changes. And it lingered. And then, you know, after six months or so, the engineer, I think, got a little impatient and decided just to go ahead with it, I assume without management permission, and just launch this thing. And within hours, an alarm goes off. Now, Bing uh, or Microsoft has lots of KPIs that they monitor automatically. And when something kind of unusually happens, you know, there's a set of different kinds of alarms go off. This was an alarm called a too-good-to-be-true alarm. And something really sort of strange happened when he launched this thing. And immediately, you know, when the alarm goes off, you know, an investigation begins. And it's usually when you get a too good to be true alarm, there's some sort of a coding error, except they couldn't find one. So they run it again and the result replicates. Now, what's even more amazing is that that change, which, by the way, again, it only took a few days of time led to a, an astonishing 12% of increased revenue. So this was more than $100 million in just that one year alone, and of course, more than $100 million in subsequent years. Now, what made the difference here? Well, the difference is the ability of an employee to actually launch the experiment and find out. Because if the employee never launched the experiment, they would have never known. It's all about opportunity cost. So it's an amazing story where a kind of a small change led to a massive impact on revenue. In fact, turns out that people at Microsoft told me that this was, in fact, the biggest, most significant change or experiment that they ran in the history of Bing. It's amazing. And it reminds me of some of the research that has been done around creativity, which is comes to a similar conclusion, which is that it's really, really hard, especially in uncertain conditions, for even the most experienced managers or the people with a lot of previous success or expertise to actually predict in the future what will succeed and what will fail. And if you look at some of the creativity science, they, you know, compositions from Beethoven and Bach and patents and all kinds of stuff. And even the most eminent creators really had very little ability to predict whether or not their next output would be a smashing success or a total failure. And that, to me, is very similar to what you're saying about business results and the importance of having a systematic approach to pursuing innovation. That's absolutely right, Matt. And I saw it in my research. In fact, I even got some data from companies on this and turns out that, and this was pretty consistent across different companies who are running a lot of these experiments, they all told me that they get it wrong about eight to nine out of 10 times. So 80 to 90% of the times when they launch an experiment and they have a hypothesis, it turns out that when they observe the result, that they get either a null result or they get a negative result. And that is that the effect is in the opposite direction of what they expected. So you can imagine now is, I mean, it's daunting, right? Is that you're running these experiments and you know ahead of time that you're much more likely to get it wrong, to get it right. And that is predicting what customers or consumers will do. And it's just kind of a, just a normal way of sort of doing things. And when you're dealing with sort of such, in quotes, high failure rates, so what is sort of the best approach to get sort of this resolved? How do we adjudicate sort of these kinds of things? And maybe the solution is, and this is, again, what I'm advocating, is 
is just to run a lot of experiments. That is, if you're running, say, a thousand experiments a year and you only get a 10% hit rate, you're still getting a hundred experiments that work. And one of those experiments could be like the Bing experiment. And you're also getting laser precision. And that is, you know, you launch an experiment. Again, if it's well designed, if it's controlled, it will actually tell you which action sort of costs what outcome. And so this is extremely powerful. So you touched on this a little bit, but to me, it's really important to understand the success rate of experiments and the reality that even some of the top experiment-driven companies in the world, people like Amazon, et cetera, are still batting way less than 50%, something like 10, 20% success rate is a great success rate for running experiments in your business. Absolutely. And and in fact, if the success rate were too high, I'd honestly be a little concerned because maybe then they're not trying hard enough. Maybe they're being too conservative about what they're trying. Maybe they're already testing things that they already know. And so, in fact, I think it's even desirable to have a fairly low success rate. By the, by the way, success is kind of a loaded word sort of in this context. Success and failure and, you know, what does failure mean? I know failure itself is not necessarily a positive word, but I'm always very careful about what I mean by failure. I draw a distinction between what I call failure and a mistake. A mistake to me is something that creates absolutely no uh, value. There's no learning going on. For example, operational execution. You know, if I'm Amazon and I'm building yet another distribution center, that to me is an operational execution. There's really no question that I'm trying to answer here. And of course, I want to minimize these kinds of things. I want to minimize mistakes. But failures are something different. Failures are kind of at the heart of how the innovation process works. And usually a failure is preceded by a question. So when I've got a question or even a hypothesis, and I run something and I get a failure, that then allows me to refine my hypothesis or even you know, refine my question and run another experiment and another experiment, another experiment. So they all build on each other and there's learning going on each time it sort of happens. So what you want to do is, as an organization, you want to create an organization where failure is okay, failure is encouraged, but where mistakes are discouraged or minimized. And that, of course, is very difficult. But if you're operating, you know, at a large number of experiments and you're operating in an environment where, in this case, failure, you know, 80, 90 percent is just the way things do work every single day. You know, it's normal. I think what I've when I run into people who operate in these kinds of environments, they're quite honestly don't think that much about these failures. It's just normal because you see so many every single day. That's a great point. And understanding that distinction between a mistake and a failure is a critical piece of the mindset of experimentation. I want to come back to the broader concept of, of using experiments within business. Let's talk about, and I'm curious to hear from you, what are some of the best practices, the strategies? Because it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I should be doing more experiments. How do we actually start to really integrate those into our business? How do we really start to think about actually bringing experimentation into the workflow and the resource allocation and the processes of an organization? That's a great question, Matt. And I think it may be helpful perhaps to take a step back and ask ourselves first, what is an experiment? Yeah, that'd be great, actually. <laughs> yes, because usually when people speak about experiments in kind of just the casual English language, I think they mean very different things. And often when I say I experiment, I mean I'm trying something. And sometimes when I see in companies an experiment becomes an experiment after the fact, you know, they've tried something and it didn't work and therefore they will call it an experiment. But it wasn't really an experiment at the outset. And so there are different kinds of experiments that companies can run. And when I talk about experiments, I mean disciplined or rigorous experiments sort of in the spirit of the scientific method. Now, there's one kind sort of let me give you kind of the pure definition first of what an ideal experiment is. And of course, sometimes we have to relax some of these conditions because sometimes the environments don't allow us to do these kinds of experiments. But 
here's what we're trying to accomplish in an experiment. In a perfect experiment, we have someone who's testing a tester. In this perfect experiment, the tester will actually separate and what we call an independent variable, that is the presumed cause, that is the thing that we're trying to change. For example, say a bonus, you know, that we want to give to the sales force from a dependent variable. And the dependent variable for us is the observed effect. So that, for example, would be the, the revenue that that salesperson generates while holding all other potential causes constant. That would be the ideal, right? So you're only changing one thing and then you're observing some variable at the end and you don't have to worry about any of the other possible sort of causes changing while I'm doing the experiment and affecting the experiment. Now, of course, that's an ideal experiment. And, you know, maybe in a scientific laboratory, sometimes you can create sort of these conditions where you can hold everything else constant. In a business, you can't really do that. So there's a lot of things that are changing all the time. And that's fine because we can deal with that. The way we actually deal sort of with a lot of things changing all the time is we randomize. So going back to the example with uh, the salesperson, what we want to do is, you know, the revenue that a salesperson generates could be affected by many things. It could be by maybe whether the person was sick on a particular day. It could be affected by the weather in certain environments. It could be affected by many, many different things, of course, but we're only interested in one thing, and that is the bonus that we're giving to that salesperson. So again, the way we deal with this in experiments, we randomize, that is, we take basically sort of two groups or multiple groups if there are multiple levels of experiments. And then what we do is we basically randomly assign sort of subjects basically sort of to these two conditions. One is basically no bonus and one is bonus. Now, why do we randomize? The reason for randomization is really clever. And that is we're taking all the other possible causes that could affect you know, revenue of that salesperson and we equally distribute it across all the different salespeople that we're testing them on. And so by, for example, flipping a coin. And so what we're doing is, this way we're doing is, we're making sure that no particular salesperson is sort of biased in a particular way, which then would sort of pollute the result. So I think, Matt, maybe you're getting a sense of where I'm heading it. There's a lot of thought that needs to kind of go into sort of the design of these kinds of things to make sure that they work. Now, Intuitively, the way people would often approach this, right, if you had this issue, the way they typically approach this, again, this let's pick the salesperson problem again. You know, what we would do is, you know, we would basically pick a period, say, of a month, and we basically, you know, let the salesperson sort of work for a month with no bonus. And then we sort of do another period for a month where we actually approach uh, the same problem again. We would basically take the salesperson and then give them a bonus, and then we compare the two periods. But that would be the wrong way to do it, because it could be that during those two periods, there are a lot of other factors at work. You know, the weather could be very different. You know, the salesperson would feel very differently. There are lots of different things going on. Maybe there are health issues, lots of different things. So we don't want to do that. We call that an observational studies because there is no control. So the reason why we do it together at the same time, we run it at the same time, we split it essentially up in a condition where there's no bonus and a condition where there's a bonus, is that we can then sort of compare and contrast. We have a control that allows us really sort of, again, to disentangle that one variable that we're interested in from all the other variables. So that's kind of just to get a sense of what a really good experiment looks like. And there are many other variables that I talk about sort of in the book that we ought to think through when we're actually designing the experiment. And some of them are may not be totally obvious, but if you don't do that, the integrity of the results that come back may not be very good. And then the problem is, and then you get a lot of noise, and then you still don't know what decision to make because of sort of the high noise conditions. Yeah, hopefully that's helpful, Matt. Yeah, that's really helpful and shines a lot of light on what needs to go into an experiment and I like the clarification of what differentiates an experiment from an observational study and those two distinctions as well. And by the way, Matt, there's a lot of research out there. There was actually a very famous paper written, a highly cited paper in the medical community where someone did like a meta study. They actually compared medical studies where 
you would imagine, you know, the rigor is much, much higher than what we typically do in management. And they actually compared, you know, observational studies with controlled studies. And turned out when they actually did the comparison, they found that most observational studies don't replicate. <laughs> and that is, you can reproduce the result that you observed in that one observational studies. And it turns out that when you have controlled studies, they are more likely to be replicated than not. And so that tells you something about the importance of making that distinction, you know, when you're trying to run experiments in which you try to identify cause and effect. Very interesting. What's up, everybody? This podcast is brought to you by MetPro, a world-renowned concierge nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle coaching company. We at the Science of Success love MetPro because they use science to help you achieve your goals. Using metabolic profiling, MetPro's team of experts analyze your metabolism and provide an individualized, custom-to-you approach to obtaining your goals. Now, MetPro is backed by data, and it's driven by science. MetPro's team of industry-leading experts are challenging generalized health guidance by teaching people how to optimally manage their weight and achieve their associated goals. As a leader, you understand it's not just about the number of hours in a day, it's about productivity. The same goes for health and wellness. It's not fundamentally about what you eat or how you train, although those are very important pieces. But what MetPro is focused on is time management, working smarter, and establishing a game plan specific to your goals and lifestyle needs. You know what? Check it out. We did an interview recently with Angelo Poli, who is the founder and CEO of MetPro. It should be last week's episode or the week before when this airs. Go check that out for a more long-form, sort of deep-dive conversation into not only what MetPro is, but the science behind it and the science of accountability and nutrition and how you can achieve your goals today. And right now, Science of Success listeners are receiving a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment and a 30-minute consultation with a MetPro expert. Claim this offer today. Head to www.metpro.co, that's M-E-T-P-R-O dot co slash success to get your complimentary metabolic profiling assessment and a 30-minute consultation. You're going to get so much value out of that 30-minute consultation. Believe me, having done it for months, I know the power. Head on over to metpro.co slash success today. I want to come back to the second part that I asked you before we delved into this really necessary definition of what an experiment is. But coming back to this idea, how do you think about the strategies, the best practices, et cetera, for actually implementing experimentation in your business because that's one i've long thought that experimentation is really important but often struggled with thinking about exactly how do we really make that a part of what we're actually executing from a day-to-day perspective in our business so the question is really how do you build an experimentation capability in your business and building a capability involves a number of different things and there are different factors and i'll just give you some examples you know without going through all of them you know the book is quite detailed about these things first of all of course you need an infrastructure you need the tools you don't want people to kind of reinvent you know sort of these tools every single time and you know some of the leading companies whether you're looking at an amazon or a booking or a microsoft or any of these companies netflix that do this at large scale in an online business they all have a fairly advanced infrastructure. But even if you go brick and mortar, even in brick and mortar environments, there are tools available that you can use. And and now the good news is there are third party tools. So you don't have to really build, you know, the same kinds of infrastructures that these companies had to build when they got started and the tools were not around. So the tools are important, but the tools turns out, and this is often surprising, The tools may be the easier part because you kind of know what to do and if you put enough money into it and you hire enough people and all that. But I think the harder part is to build a culture for experimentation, you know, to make sure that the behaviors and the norms and these kinds of things actually facilitate experiments rather than inhibit them. And that can be tricky especially when you're trying to go up in scale, you know, when you're trying to do more than maybe just run five or 10 of those a year, when you suddenly want to run a hundred or 500 or even a thousand or even more than that, the culture really gets in the way. 
And there's a number of different elements that I identify, Matt, that are important when you're thinking about an experimentation culture. In fact, uh, I call sort of when you reach the end point, when you really create an experimentation culture, I call this an experimentation organization. Uh, let me give you just quick five examples. The first is what I call cultivate curiosity. You know, in, if you want to experiment, you need curious people because they need to ask a lot of questions and they need to come up with a lot of hypotheses because in order to feed a big experimentation apparatus, you know, if you want to feed the infrastructure, you need a lot of hypotheses to feed it. And so unless you have a curious environment where people see failures, not as costly mistakes, but as opportunities for learning, you're not going to get there. The second thing I think that's really important is to create an environment where data trumps opinions most of the time and that is you know and this is really difficult because you know we often are driven by opinions sometimes the boss's opinions that's not going to work in an environment like this so human nature is a big obstacle here and you know we tend to happily accept uh, what we call good results the kinds of results that seem to go with our intuition or that confirm our biases but when we see something that we consider to be bad that goes against our assumptions, we will then thoroughly investigate those things and even challenge them. So you need to kind of create an environment where, in fact, uh, where the data is, is essentially king. That doesn't mean, by the way, that every decision has to be made exactly sort of according sort of to what the experiment says. There are other reasons why you may not want to do that. But on average, and most of the times, the data has to trump opinions. The third one is what I call you have to democratize experiments. That means you have to empower people to run experiments without getting permission every single time. Because if they have to go permission every single time, you're not going to get scale. So that requires, again, an environment that's totally transparent, where people can also stop any experiment that they want, but it's completely democratized. The fourth one is ethics. You know, when you run any experiments, you've got to be ethically sensitive. Sometimes it's very difficult to answer that question, to figure out what is actually unethical and what is ethical. Sometimes it's actually quite clear cut. But, you know, if you're running unethical experiments, I can tell you it's not going to be good for business in the long run. And there are many examples out there when companies kind of ran experiments that maybe they didn't consider them to be unethical, but where users were not really happy about them. And that really backfired. And then finally, a fifth one, and there's more out there, but just want to give you five examples, is you have to embrace a different leadership model. That is, the role that leaders have to play in an experimental culture is actually quite different than what they traditionally do. If, in fact, it turns out that a lot of decisions are adjudicated by experiments, you have to ask yourself, what, in fact, is the role of a senior leader in an environment like this? I'd be curious to dig into that a little bit more. What are the changes in the leadership model that are necessitated by a focus on experimentation, a focus on more data, and a focus on using some of these methodologies? Well, I think, first of all, leaders have to acknowledge that maybe sometimes they're part of the problem rather than just being only part of the solution. There's a word for those leaders out there in the community it's called a hippo, a highest paid person's opinion. And we all know that hippos are very dangerous animals. And sometimes, you know, when the hippos are out there, when they're circulating in an organization, it's very difficult, you know, for, for employees to challenge these hippos. So what is, in fact, then the role of these senior leaders? Well, I've defined three roles, three important roles in these kinds of environments. Of course, there are still some decisions like what's the strategic direction and, you know, what acquisitions to make. These are the kinds of things that may not be testable anyway. But when it's testable, three things, again, which I think are really important. First of all, the leader has to set a grand challenge that can be broken into testable hypotheses. Why is that important? Well, if you have an environment where there's a lot of people who are just experimenting, running lots of experiments, you want to make sure that the experiments are aiming at a certain direction rather than just doing things willy-nilly. There has to be kind of an overall program 
that these experiments kind of push forward. So that's what I call the grand challenge. You know, what is the grand challenge here that we're sort of aiming towards? And then, you know, once you have a grand challenge, you obviously you may not be able to test that grand challenge. For example, it could be, you know, create sort of the best online user experience in the industry. You know, you got to then break that down into lots of small hypotheses that all kind of aim towards that goal. The second one, and that one is really important as well, is senior leaders have to put in place the systems and the resources to make it possible. You can't expect organizations to suddenly do a lot of experiments if the resources and the systems are not in place. It's things like what I talked about before, infrastructure, tools, and so on. And then they also need to think about what the right organizational design is. You know, how do I, like if people are starting to experiment, like which groups start out, you know, where's the expertise in my organization? How do I roll it out? You know, what are the decision rights and so on and so on. And then the third role, which I think is just as important, is to be a role model. Now, what does it mean to be a role model? It means that the leaders have to live by the same rules as everyone else. It also means that their own ideas have to be subjected to these kinds of tests. And that's very difficult. You know, one CEO told me that this is hard for most uh, CEOs. You can't have an ego thinking that you always know best. So it involves going into a meeting and, and telling people, I just don't know. And admit that you're wrong, having intellectual humility and so on. You know, Francis Bacon, the forefather of the scientific method, once said, and I, I really love that quote, Matt, if a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. You have to have that. You know, that's kind of the challenge. And so I think a lot of the leaders have to look in the mirror and really ask themselves whether their approach is really the right approach in this world that we're sort of currently you know, operating in. There's a fun story at Booking.com where a new CEO came in and the team had some discussion around sort of what the best logo design is and the CEO then basically said, you know, I decided this is the logo that we're gonna go with. And uh, people then looked at him and asked, well, well, that's an interesting suggestion. We'll run the test and we'll let you know what happens. And uh, you need that healthy culture, you know, where even the senior leaders can be challenged. Yeah, that's such a great point. And oftentimes, one of my favorite Peter Drucker quotes is that the bottleneck is always at the top of the bottle. And in the same vein, it's so easy for leadership to sometimes get in their own way around looking at the data or putting their own opinions aside, etc. And sometimes, Matt, you know, even the leaders have the best intentions. There's a great story, another story, uh, Ron Johnson. I don't know if you're familiar with that story. Ron Johnson was together with Steve Jobs. You know, they created the Apple Store. And it's really fascinating because the Apple Store is by, you know, by any measure, you know, perhaps the most successful retail concept that I think was created maybe in the last decade. And, you know, enormously successful. And J.C. Penney, you know, another big retailer in the US decides, you know, they're looking at Apple and they're seeing all these amazing things happening. And you know, they decide, you know, why don't we hire Ron Johnson as the CEO and with a mandate to do the sorts of magical things that he did for Apple. And at the time, I think Ron was a retail god, I mean, by any measure. So he gets hired as a CEO with a big incentive package. He comes to JCPenney and starts to implement a new bold plan. And so he does the kinds of things that he did at Apple, such as eliminating coupons. You know, he, uh, you know, has branded boutiques and new technology and all sorts of things. And 17 months later, you know, JCPenney is fighting for survival. Sales have plunged, you know, losses are soaring. And Johnson sort of loses his job and he's out and they're bringing the old CEO back in with a mandate to restore all the things that they did before Johnson arrived. And so the question is, what actually went wrong? I mean, they had lots of data and so forth. And if you can listen to the folks there and the people on the board and others, they will tell you is that you know part of the problem is that we didn't run the test, we didn't run the experiments that probably could have told 
you, we don't know. It's a counterfactual. We don't know whether it would have. But they probably could have at least given you an indication that some of these changes are not going to work for the kinds of customers that go to a J.C. Penny. And even Ron Johnson kind of later on reflected on this. And he said, and I think rightfully so, he doesn't consider himself to be an arrogant person. He actually comes across as quite modest. But he referred to this as situational arrogance. So it's not that you're generally arrogant and you get so confident in your results because you're so successful that you become situationally arrogant. And the kinds of context that he was in, you know, just didn't transfer into the context that J.C. Penney had. And so you have to, again, even as a senior leader, even when you're really successful, you always got to look in the mirror and say, you know, is what I'm doing really true? And even run the test. And, you know, we've seen it at Snap Inc. It happened and many other companies where people, you know, where senior leaders kind of got a little bit ahead of themselves. They didn't do enough testing and they paid the price. Such a great insight. I want to bring back one other topic that we touched on earlier and just get your sense around this. Is there a certain organizational scale that this starts to kick in at or asking this in a different way? I can see this totally makes sense at a Fortune 500, a big company, huge budget. You know, you could have a whole department that's doing this. For somebody who's in a small business or a startup or there's a sense of resource scarcity, how do you think about implementing this experimentation mindset and methodology at a smaller scale at an organization that may not have the budget or the opportunity to pursue it at that big of a a level? Yes, even smaller companies that don't have the budgets or the resources can in fact adopt the same kinds of approaches. In fact, I think in these kinds of environments, it, it may be even more valuable. And by the way, research by one of my colleagues has actually shown that they do actually adopt sort of a lot of the tools in one space, for sure, are called A-B testing. It's kind of one kind of experiment. And there are lots of tools out there. They adopt those tools. And it actually helps them because the tools end up being less expensive than heavily investing in market research, which they often don't have the resources for either. And rather than doing a lot of market research and trying to kind of figure out what works and what doesn't work through more qualitative methods, they'll just test it. So that's one issue. The other issue that often comes up, Matt, is the issue of uh, sample size. You know, yes, you know, maybe we're a startup, maybe we have very small sample sizes or even in a brick and mortar environment, you know, we don't have, you know, we're not like a booking, you know, that has five to 700 million visitors a month. You know, we may have a much, much smaller number of visitors to our website, or if we are a brick and mortar environment, you know, we may only have maybe a few stores or so in which we can try to experiment in. It turns out that even in small sample environment, you can run experiments. There are actually, again, analytical techniques that are available that allow you to get meaningful results from small sample environments, uh, which are, you know, some of these methods are, again, described in the book. Uh, there's another thing also which is important too, and that is turns out that when you make bigger changes, you end up needing smaller sample sizes. It has to do with the power of statistical concept. And if you, you know, make very small changes, then of course you need larger sample size. And the intuition is quite clear. That is, you know, you have a lot of noise in the background. And if you make big changes, you want to basically, you know, detect sort of the changes relative to the noise and it just takes you know the bigger sort of the changes you know the easier it is to detect it so you can get away with smaller sample sizes so i encourage you know smaller organizations that perhaps have much less traffic or even sort of in brick and mortar you know encourage them to have make bigger changes it's also the question what do you use experiments for you know there are different kinds of experiments that you can run you can certainly run optimization kind of experiments this is the the kinds of experiments that say an Amazon would run on their websites to make sure, you know, that everything is optimized and that's what everybody essentially, so all the big players essentially do. But you can also run exploration type of experiments where maybe you just explore a direction. Now, that's not going to give you causality because you may be changing too many variables at the same time. 
to give you kind of a meaningful sense for causality about one individual variable, but it may give you just a sense of direction, which then can be followed up by smaller experiments, more isolated experiments, that then can teach you again about causality. So you're mixing, you know, you're going back and forth, you could maybe toggle between your more exploration type of experiments and then more optimization kind of experiments. So there are lots of different ways of doing this. And again, I try to outline all this sort of these different ways in the book. So for listeners who want to concretely implement this in their lives in some way, what would be one action step that you would give them to start implementing more experimentation in their lives or their business? Well, I think at the beginning, you need to first acknowledge, you need to be aware that experimentation matters. You know, I always tell people, you know, experimentation is the engine of innovation. So if you want to innovate, you need to experiment. Now, most people would say, and in fact, all people would say, that's a good thing. I understand that I need to experiment more. But then the question is, what's the next step? The next step is you need to adopt some sort of a rigorous framework. You know, you have to build some discipline around it rather than thinking about experiments. Okay, we're just trying something. I think that's an important starting point and be committed to building an organization capability around it. It also means that you can't do it alone. You need people around you. And then once you start, you know, once you have some sort of a framework in place, You know, it doesn't have to be the ideal experiment, but it needs to have some elements of what a good experiment is. Once you have that in place, you can start sort of thinking about designing experiments. What would be involved, for example? Well, the ability to write down a good hypothesis. We often, you know, we know we use the word hypothesis all the time, but trying to understand sort of what a good hypothesis is and what a bad hypothesis is, maybe train people, giving them templates of what it is. And that's just an example of what I mean by a framework. And then once you kind of have that in place, you just got to get going on it so you get better at it and start over time then scaling it. People sometimes get a little nervous when they hear, oh, okay, the companies are running, you know, a thousand experiments a year, even tens of thousands of experiments a year. You have to always remember that all these companies started small. You know, they all started with a handful of experiments. And then over time, they just got better and better, and they gradually sort of increased scale. And I think that would be my recommendation. Just get going on it. You know, don't think too much about it. Experimentation is going to be part of the competitive game going forward, whether you're in digital, moving into digital or not digital. In fact, you know, some CEOs told me that are doing this at large scale, you know, unless you do this, you're going to be dead. So I mean, that's a pretty big endorsement. But that's kind of my advice. Get going on it. And where can listeners find you and the book and your work online? The book is, of course, available in all bookstores, you know, online and also physical bookstores. It's out there, you know, all the, you know, usual ones, you know, Amazon, Martin and Noble, independent bookstores and so forth. If they want to learn more about what I do, you can find me online. I'm at Harvard Business School. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. been here for almost 25 years now. You would find me on www.tomkey.com, and that will take you directly to Harvard Business School, my, my website. You can also go directly to Harvard Business School and search me. If you want to contact me, you can send me a LinkedIn request. Just tell me where you heard me so I can make the connection. Uh, if you've got a question, send me an email. It's very simple as well. It's just the letter T, just T at hbs.edu. So lots of different ways sort of to get to me. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing all this wisdom, great insights into the power of experimentation. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created the show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including 
an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or if you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. Mm -hmm.